Hey everyone, and good evening, and welcome once again to Have a Seat with Chris Hansen, the Tuesday COVID-19 edition. If you had told me nine weeks ago that we'd be still doing this show on Tuesday nights, I don't know if I'd believe it. But so it is in this country, around the world, we are still gripped in this pandemic. We have talked to many experts, frontline medical people, law enforcement, emergency folks, kids, students, the whole thing as we've covered this crisis. And tonight, we're going to dig into the world of sports and ask the question, will we be able to have a seat and watch a sporting event anytime soon? And we've got some great guests tonight. Rick Christ, who's with the uh, Deet Sports and Entertainment Organization. He runs their Cleveland office. He at one time was a commissioner with the Mid-American Conference. He knows all about college sports, and he's got his finger on the pulse of professional athletics as well. We also have Eric Palms tonight, who is the CEO of the Capital One Orange Bowl and who recently was very instrumental in bringing the 2021 College Football National Championships to Miami and the Hard Rock Stadium, which will be interesting to talk to him about how all this is going to play out. Tracy Birchmeyer is here. She's a nurse in the COVID-19 unit of a major medical center here in suburban Detroit, where I've been broadcasting during the pandemic, hanging out here, but I think I'll head back to New York soon. Uh, I should say that Eric is in Miami, Tracy also in suburban Detroit. She's going to give us her take on the very latest from the front lines, as well as her feelings about the safety medically of putting a bunch of people together in a stadium under any circumstances. But let's start with Rick Christ of the Deet Sports and Entertainment Organization based in Detroit. He is in Cleveland tonight. Rick, thanks for being with us. How are you doing? Doing great, Chris. Appreciate, uh, appreciate being with you. I, thanks for being here. I truly appreciate it myself. I, I have so many questions. I, I almost don't know where to begin. And, and you follow this stuff very closely as a, as a lawyer, a, a, a guy who's involved in sports marketing and major events. You know athletes, you know uh, coaches. Your brother's the head football coach at Wisconsin. Your other brother has been an assistant coach in the NFL for many years. You talk to these guys every day. We should be in the beginning of the baseball season right now. We should be heading into the playoffs for basketball and hockey. We should be talking about college football and the NFL. We just saw the draft. Are we going to see anything remotely close to athletics in the next six months? That's, uh, I think that's the question, Chris. And um, uh, whatever we see in the next six months, I don't think it's, at all like we would have anticipated 90 days ago. So I think we're all adjusting to whatever becomes, um, you know, pick your cliche, the new normal. And, um, and, and it's uncertain. And so uh, as you'll talk with Eric, I'm sure as you're talking with people in other industries, I think the first thing is to recognize this is bigger than just our little slice of it. And, and then you start preparing with scenarios but you've, you've got to be cognizant that you only have so much information right now. So um, I think uh, for each of the pro leagues, they're at different points, not only in their normal calendar, but also each league's revenue streams are, are different and the business of their industry is different. The same is true on the college side. And uh, I think everyone has certain mile markers that they're looking at. But um, my sense is that it's going to be very state-driven, uh, science-driven, health-driven, and we hope to know more in 30 days. Uh, uh, but I think everyone's prepared for something that doesn't look like we've come become accustomed to. We should be watching hockey and basketball right now. Is that going to even happen for the rest of the year? Is that that's just done, pretty much, right? My sense is, is that each of those leagues really is um, focused on trying to, um, if they can get to their postseason, I think they're, they're interested in that. So um, uh, uh, again, I think there's some benchmarks to that. Certainly uh, uh, state driven, certainly the ability to test and to track. And um, I, I think uh, almost every league has contemplated uh, scenarios where there's limited or no spectators. Uh, I see ESPN early in the morning is uh, we're, we're watching Korean baseball. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's starting to come back. Uh, UFC had 
its event the other night. And so I don't, um, I don't know that uh, we would have heard if, if the NBA or the NHL had written it off. And I think uh, they're trying to keep as many scenarios open as possible for as long as possible. Baseball, there's talk of an 82 game season. Um, you take a look at this past season, the Washington uh, Nationals, you know, started at something like 19 and 23 early in the season. I mean, that's halfway through that season, and yet they went on to win the World Series. It, it, it's it, you know, baseball is is predicated upon this lengthy season of nine innings plus, you know, night after night after night under the stars and the sun and Tiger Stadium and wherever. Uh, is it, I mean, is it even going to be close to the same thing? Is Are we just going to have to get our minds around the fact that it's a whole different game? No pun intended. I think, I, I think um, certainly the ability to look at things fresh is going to be important. And you got to love baseball because there's so many data points. And already, right. uh, as the hundred or the eighty-two game season has floated, you've got the analytics already in play, saying a hundred gives you a true sample size within plus or minus zero point zero zero one percent. Eighty-two, not quite as ideal, but people are feeling like it's okay. At least these first swipes at it. I think from a competitor standpoint. These guys are are eager to get out there, and they're eager to compete. And if you give them the ground rules, and if everyone's playing by the same ground rules, you'll see competition. And uh, and uh, there'll be an asterisk by this, but I think we're all living in, a, in an asterisk world right now. That's a, that's an excellent point. Let's bring in Eric Palms now from Miami tonight, actually in Fort Lauderdale, but he is uh, the CEO of the Capital One Orange Bowl. And also, as I mentioned earlier, very involved in the 2021 College Football National Championship, which will be in Miami this year. In all your years, Eric Palms, did you ever <laughs> dream of a scenario like the one in which we are living this evening? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, it is unprecedented. Uh, we obviously, um, like everybody, are navigating this new norm. Uh, but I grew up here in South Florida. I grew up with the Orange Bowl since I was a kid. I started to work here, I guess, in 1993. So this is 27 years. Never have seen anything like this. Now, the national championship for college football, and, and again, I will kind of skip around here, but that, that's not even until, you know, New Year's, January right. of 2021. Are there already contingency plans being discussed as to how the heck this is going to happen? I mean, this is, you know, forget the NFL season for a minute, forget baseball, forget hockey and basketball. We're talking about something that's going to happen in the next calendar year. Are you guys already figuring out how the heck are we going to do this? Well, remember, we're we're postseason college football. Right. But so what happens in September through December impacts January. And right now we have the Capital One Orange Bowl on January 2nd, followed by the national championship game nine days later. Um, we're in a whole pattern. Um, you know, like Rick here, who's been a former commissioner, can attest, you know, college football has their – uh, connect, connectedness uh, through now the college football playoff, before that the bowl championship series. But each conference independently operates. And so you've got, you know, the five major conferences. You've got Notre Dame. You have the five other uh, conferences that play major college football. And, you know, I think everybody's being very deliberate right now to see what the political leadership, what the health experts are going to, you know, envision uh, campuses can do in the fall, and by virtue of that, what college football can do. Uh, but yeah, I think from our standpoint, we're a nonprofit organization. We have, you know, leaders here in South Florida that are standing on the shoulders of many generations of leaders. And, um, you know, we think in the next maybe month or two, we're going to get a little more of a read of what's going to happen. And uh, in the duration, our staff is working remotely. Uh, we're being very focused on every contingency that's out there. And when that decision's finally made, we'll be ready to immediately pivot and get ready for the football season. What are your thoughts as somebody who's in and around this world? And I want to ask you, Rick, as well, uh, how do you have a sporting event given how contagious this virus is, 
given the severity, its impact on some people, many people. And, you know, are, are, are we going to have a third of the crowd? Are we going to have no crowd for a period of time and watch it on TV only? Um, masks, partitions, do you have any sense, any intel on the look of the near-term future of professional athletics? Well, it's a great question. I think that will be answered as time plays out here in the next month or two for us. But I would say we're very fortunate uh, that we play in the home of the Miami Dolphins, Hard Rock Stadium. It's an incredibly run uh, facility. And yeah, they're planning. Uh, they're an NFL franchise, much like in Detroit, you have the Lions. And um, I think they're looking at every scenario from no fans to a certain segment of fans. And in our case, as you mentioned earlier, Chris, we're playing in January. So what's it going to look like then? And so, yeah, I think for all of us, you know, we're we're trying to be as proactive as we can. You can have a tendency to start chasing every scenario and uh, you have to caution yourself just to be prepared. But, uh, yeah, I think all the things you mentioned are in play. Uh, but hopefully, you know, things improve and government gets more comfortable, health experts get more comfortable, and ultimately people can get back to some sense of normalcy. Rick, what do you think? Are you going to be watching an Indians game in your hometown of Cleveland area at all this year? <laughs> I think that could happen. I do think, picking up on Eric's point, Chris, one of the, um, as with other industries, one of the positive is that people share information. And I think through that process, you're going to see um, a culture develop and, you know, whether it's under the heading of best practices or, or innovative thinking or sort of shared beliefs, I think you'll start seeing a consensus building. What is open, though, is sort of fan behavior. And everyone's got their own uh, risk assessment that they're going to have to go through. Um, I think it, and Eric and I have talked about this, I do think uh, it cuts differently at the college level than at the pro level from a business standpoint to the extent that um, I think the pros are probably more equipped uh, with with uh, their stadiums as TV studios, if you will. And you know, when you've got, they've all scaled their stadiums on the football side in that right. 60, 65,000 range. You know, here on the college side, you've got the big house, you've got Ohio Stadium, you've got the SEC schools, you know, you're talking a hundred plus thousand seat stadiums. So, um, so I do think the, those dynamics will start entering in and, uh, and that may, that may um, uh, inform different decision making. Speaking of decision making, I want to bring in Tracy Birchmeyer now, uh, who is a nurse at a major medical center right here in metropolitan Detroit. She's been on the front lines in the battle against COVID-19 in the COVID-19 unit. Tracy, how are you tonight? Good. Thanks for asking. How's your health? Uh, so far, so good. Um, Thankfully, not too many nurses have been coming down with it in my area, um, the areas that I'm working in. So, good. What, what worries you most about the health and safety of tens of thousands of people gathering in a stadium for a sporting event anytime soon? Um, I think the big thing that bothers me or that concerns me the most is that people don't know that they have COVID-19. You know, it, it, it's almost dormant sometimes for days on end. When they say that they need um, people to self-isolate after potential contact with uh, another person that has it for 14 days, I mean, it might not appear until day 13 or 14. So you don't really know if you have it and you could be infecting hundreds of people. So that, that definitely concerns me, but I'm not, those are just my thoughts as a nurse. Um, just that you just don't know if you're gonna, if you already have it. I don't know that I didn't, you know, become exposed at work on Sunday. So I don't know that I don't have it. I feel fine, but you just don't know. And I wanna talk a little later in the show about uh, 
how things have been going in terms of the level of patients you're seeing and, and discharging, et cetera. But when we talk about putting a large group together, and I, I know you don't have a crystal ball, Rick doesn't have a crystal ball, Eric doesn't have one, but is there any responsible way this summer, even with face masks and hand washing stations and hand sanitizer every 10 feet. Is there any way you can have a live sporting event with people in the stands? Is that even possible based on your medical experience? I, I honestly do not know. And I come from a big football area. So um, I'm sure that the powers that be that make these decisions are, you know, wondering if, if it's possible to, you know, carry forward with the season and decide if um, it's appropriate and if people will, um, if they can do some safe distancing or protective distancing, they say mask, you know, and hand sanitizer and washing hands are good, which I definitely agree with, but you, you never know. And I feel sorry for the people that are making those decisions because I, I don't know how they do it, to be honest. I mean, what's the right decision? Do you let the economy recover? Um, do you let the schools go on? Do you let people go back to their lives? Or do you keep waiting and waiting and waiting? I, who knows what the best decision is going to be? Well, let me ask you, Rick, Chris. I mean, these discussions are going on in every sports franchise, every college in America right now and in, in the world, you know, really. And I, it, there is no clear path forward here. This is always going to be a little bit of a guessing game until we get some sort of herd immunity until we get some sort of, you know, effective vaccine in place. Uh, is it just going to be watching the games with no natural sound on, on television for a while? <laughs> it, it, it sure seems like that right now, at least if you're talking through the summer months, Chris. I do think um, uh, what's been instructive to me and sort of my little slice of all this is that you've seen uh, the college conferences, you've seen at an NCA level, uh, you see with Eric and his leadership group, people really trying to get their sort of their decision making structure in place. And then, um, and then really understand that, that it's not just your decision and that you're part of uh, a bigger community. And it does seem that, that uh, the states are certainly one of the triggers in terms of college sports. Uh, I absolutely think that um, uh, the first trigger will be our students coming back to campus in any meaningful way. And then at that point, you probably move a little more broadly into sort of what the sport dynamics are. And you know, in terms of football, if the NFL is playing, that'll inform how the colleges are looking at it. Having said that, I do think that um, the NFL is probably more inclined to just move forward, um, uh, even if it does mean no fans in the stands. That's a little different proposition for, for the major universities. So, uh, and again, testing and um, tracking and all the areas that Tracy is uh, right um, is involved with is is going to be the bigger driver and you know whether it's the big 10 which has you know a, a really blue ribbon committee of health experts advising their conference commissioner and the leadership in the big 10 and other conferences the same way you know i think people have got their decision making in place and are going to work with the data they have as soon as they get it what about the economic impact here, Eric? You know, you've got a situation um, where it's not just tickets being sold that make the money, it's the concessions, it's the parking, it's the saloons in the neighborhood near the stadium. It's, you know, it, it, it reverberates throughout the entire economy. You just had the Super Bowl in Miami. They're going to have it in Tampa this year. Right. Um, that's a, that's a heck of a hit. And at some point, do players have to eat some of this to help the owners and the league get through it? Yeah, I mean, from the prism of uh, college football, um, obviously, um, 
you know, that's very much in play. I mean, there's 40 plus bowl games across the country and we're one of those uh, bowl games that have been doing this for a long, long time. So, you know, our mission statement going back to 1935 was all about tourism. That's why it all started. They saw what was happening in Pasadena with the Rose Bowl and they wanted to emulate it in a, in a Miami that wasn't the Miami of today. It was kind of a sleepy town and they want to have an event that could bring uh, tourists from all over the, the country down to the area. And that's continued now. We're in year 87. Um, you know, we're hopeful that as we sit here right now, which is, you know, May, that things will improve and people will get more comfortable, that people will be eager to, um, to you know, go and travel and, and, and to participate in a bowl game. But as we mentioned earlier, we have to be, you know, planning for all these contingencies and so forth. So, um, you know, we're going to wait and see. I think there's great people that are leading the decision-making process. They're obviously taking their their leads from the governors, from the university presidents that ultimately will make this decision. Uh, but yeah, I do think that when it comes to professional sports, just as a fan watching from the outside looking in, that you're seeing that. I think there's discussions all across the country, not just the country, but the world where you see European soccer clubs having these discussions about how do they make this work because the economics have been uh, brought to a head. So, um, you know, in the end, uh, we've had a lot of lead time on this. And I think, you know, the conference commissioners that Rick mentioned are really being as proactive, as aggressive as they can be to be in the best position to make decisions based on things that they may not control. Rick, what do you see the economic impact being? And again, you see this from a, a sports uh, entertainment marketing standpoint. You, you know, your company puts together a lot of big deals, big events. Is this going to grind to a halt for a little bit here? I think it's absolutely shifted gears. And, um, uh, and, at least as it relates to college sports, but certainly across the major event space, uh, you know, this could be a reset. And uh, college sports has enjoyed unprecedented growth over the last couple decades. And certainly media has fueled much of that, but, but not only that. And I think uh, big entertainment, big events, uh, has come to define both the college and professional sports space now uh, and eric and i have talked about this you know if and when we do come back and if and when folks are able to come together i think there'll be a real feeling of celebration and appreciation for for those opportunities and we probably all get spoiled a little bit and i think um this period of time is allowing us to really <laughs> refocus and yeah. uh, and understand. So, I think uh, I think everyone's going to be figuring it out a little bit, Chris. And um, to me, these are leadership windows for people, and uh, for those that are innovative, and 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 really for those organizations, institutions that really understand. I think their their core values, not to get too philosophical about this, but those who really know who they are are going to be better positioned coming out of this thing. You know, I remember going to uh, the first World Series game in Yankee Stadium after 9-11, wow. and uh, President Bush at the time threw out the first pitch, and the security was incredible, and I happened to be sitting there with an FBI agent uh, and, and two other buddies, and you know, they flew him in and out in the chopper. And I remember just the, the feeling of pride mm -hmm. that we could all do this again mm -hmm. and in a different way. And again, you know, we thought 9-11 was the worst thing we'd ever see. And now this is, you know, so historic and tragic in a whole different way. I suppose that it just makes us better and stronger and appreciate these sporting events that we may have taken for granted for so long. I think so. And I think, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, you, you value those times and those memories and, um, and, uh, it might be in a different way than what we've done, uh, in the past, but 
I think we'll still all be looking for those opportunities in the future for our peers and for our kids and for everyone you know that shares that connectivity at college level, pro level, music and entertainment across the board. What about college kids who are getting ready to wrap up their athletic career and are going to try to go pro? You know, somebody who's a junior and wants one more year and needs that break. What's going to happen to these kids? Uh, I think, um, uh, you know, I I think those opportunities will still be there. And I think, um, you know, in terms of my brother, you mentioned my younger brother, Paul, who's at Wisconsin, you know, I know where he's spending his time and that's staying connected with his guys. And so um, the the training regimen looks different. Um, the, the, the business part of what these kids may be um, uh, calibrating could look different. But, um, you know, I think there will be competition. I think there will be opportunities. And, uh, and so I don't think they're going to miss windows. I sure hope not. Is there any part of this uh, based upon your conversations with your brother, who's the head football coach at Wisconsin, that, that is going to change besides, you know, whether or not we have people in the stands and how many people and how far apart and what kind of face masks? I mean, do, do you think we're still going to have a college football season come fall? Um, I think we'll have a college football season. <laughs> how much of it's in the fall and maybe how much of it's somewhere else, I think, is a little bit TBD. Um, I do think this whole process will, and, and I'm guessing it's true in other industries and in other spaces, I think it is sort of it has you getting back down to the, to the studs, if you will, and, and really evaluating what's most important what um, is essential. And uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, in talking with Paul, you know, the football part of it, I think for them will be the, the easy part, if you will. And it's sort of what has been built up around it and how does that change and how does that impact sort of the, the core parts of all this. I will say, I think, we've made great strides on the college side in terms of um, informed medical <laughs> uh, support around the health and safety of, of the sport. Obviously that's been, um, uh, that's been a, a topic that's been top of mind for people for, for a while now. And, and we, we, we're making, important progress there we're not all the way where we want to be but but um the sport's much safer than it than it was um uh, 15 20 years ago and our training is much more informed and sophisticated and um uh and sort of athlete first so i think chris those will be the types of things that really um uh trigger what the next steps in the sequence are in terms of coming back to play. And, and I feel good that those that communication's occurring right now in a real healthy way. Eric, what are the conversations now in terms of, you know, moving forward, you know, with your colleagues when you talk about college sports? I mean, obviously, you've got some time. You've got the benefit of, uh, of, of you know, watching before your major events take place there. But but what, what's the thought process from here? How do, you, how do you keep all this together for a college football season, even a college basketball season? It's a great question. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're a, a nonprofit organization that's built on volunteerism. So uh, we're a little different than you would find at a athletic department on a major college campus or a franchise front office. But from the standpoint of planning, I mean, we take literally a year to get everything in place, and there's a huge fundraising component that's involved here. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we're all dealing with this, and and you know, postseason college football bowl games are no different. This is a critical window to be out there and to connect with your community and your corporate leaders and your stakeholders, whether they're ticket patrons, 
Um, this is a critical window, and it's very difficult out there right now. There's, you know, real headwinds, and it's understandably so. Uh, in terms of planning with the decision makers, which are conference commissioners, athletic directors, and, of course, university presidents, I think we're in that window. I would expect in the next month or two, as mentioned earlier, that there should be some direction with regard to, you know, the schedule and where they expect the season to be. And we're just, you know, right now getting all the things in place so that once that decision is made, we're able to launch and to get all those volunteers mobilized to do what we normally do. And our volunteers are, are you know, CEO, C-level type individuals here throughout South Florida that give their time to this. So it's critical that you get, you know, that planning window in place. Um, from a business standpoint, we're very connected to our partners, Hard Rock Stadium, first and foremost, and to be able to get all those things that have to be in place because you've got a University of Miami schedule that's there. You have a Miami Dolphins schedule that is there. There is a huge tennis tournament that comes to the stadium in the spring. And whatever these decisions are, we have to thread that needle to have all these people aligned to make you know, everything to come together comfortably and that if there is some mobilizing that inevitably I'm expecting there will be that there were ready to make those things happen in a very proactive and a very efficient way. Tracy Birchmeyer, as you mentioned earlier, your medical center is near not just one, but, you know, multiple major uh, sporting arenas, football, basketball um, in, in, in the suburban Detroit area. If we put too many people in stadiums too soon, what do you expect to see at your medical center in terms of COVID-19? A flare, it, the curve will, instead of flattening like it is, um, it'll, it'll start to gain some momentum again um, and it will rise again. And at least that's what I would anticipate happening. Um, hopefully I'm very wrong. Um, but no, I would expect to see a flare up of um, COVID-19 cases for sure. And what are you seeing in the COVID unit now at your uh, medical center? Are things getting better? Um, they are getting better, actually. We are getting um, transfers from other facilities that are, are very sick patients. But as far as the patients that we're getting um, from our emergency room and stuff like that, or um, other units of the hospital, uh, they don't seem to be as sick. Um, which is great. We do have some sick patients right now that have been sick since the beginning of April um, and they're just not getting well. It's taking a long time for them to recover. Um, we're seeing there's been no change as far as who's affected and who's not affected. There's the young people, um, people in their 20s that are our patients. Uh, and then there's the people that are in their 80s and 90s that you know, are doing fine and that they've left the institution. So, which is amazing. Um, and so we are seeing real recoveries. Um, we're seeing, I feel like we're, I feel like we're treating them much better now that we have a little bit of understanding and that people are recovering better. And what is your greatest fear about people gathering in the near term? Um, you know, you heard uh, Rick and Eric talk about, you know, sporting events taking place without crowds. We've heard this, um, you know, all over the sports pages. And the crowd is going to move, whether the crowd is at the uh, field house or wherever, the crowd will happen. You know, it just might be at somebody's home instead or somebody's backyard. The crowds will still happen. Um, nobody likes to watch football alone. <laughs> That's a good point. You know. When is it going to be safe to do this, Tracy? And again, I, I, I don't mean I don't mean to put the weight of the world and sporting fans around the world. I don't know. What do you you know you're the you're right on the on the front I line. I don't this. know. I mean, there are so many new tests, so many new um, studies that are being done on this, and I feel like you know in the next three to six months we'll have a much better understanding of you know what exactly COVID nineteen can do. Um, I feel like we still are just learning. I mean, it's 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 changing, it's evolving. I feel. Um, I I also think that you know once the vaccines start happening, that would certainly make me feel more comfortable going to a football stadium for sure. Rick, what uh, 
what worries you most about the near term near term future of, of both college and, and pro sports, given what this uh, the impact of this COVID nineteen pandemic? That's a that's an interesting question. I would say on the college side, um, my biggest concern would probably be focused on the ability uh, for for the universities to move at some level in a coordinated way, Chris. And um, we, we get used to national competition. We get used to uh, conference competition. And yet um, it's so much more decentralized than a professional league. And so my, my concern would probably be not only competitively, but maybe um, in terms of decision making and in terms of uh, sort of um, values that we splinter. Um, you know, on the professional side, my guess is, you know, there will be difficult business discussions but I, I do think it's probably a little more streamlined a decision-making process. So, you know, I would hope on the college side that we can continue to maintain the opportunities uh, that have been out there uh, in terms of sports across the board, in terms of scholarships for not just football and men's basketball, but really across um, the the usually 20 plus sports at universities sponsor. Um, uh, it, we may have a reset in some areas, facilities, staffing, some of those other areas, but I would hope that the fundamental opportunities that are present now can sustain. I do think this will be a very challenging environment for higher education. And, and I think this may pull the curtain back a little bit further on sort of how healthy some institutions, universities are or aren't. And technology plays into that. We're, we're probably getting much more accustomed right. to an online experience. And, um, and I think there's, there's reason for there to be some nervousness and maybe some anxiety across higher ed generally. I mean, if you can't get kids into the classroom for the fall semester at Michigan, Michigan State, Ohio State, Notre Dame, University of Florida, how are you going to get them in the stadium? You're yeah. not. And right? you're, you're not going to bring your teams back if you don't have students on campus. You're just not. Do you think there's a chance we won't see college football start in late August, early September? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, my sense would be we're not at that point yet. But I think uh, the leadership of college football is certainly um, uh, trying to anticipate and prepare for a number of scenarios. And uh, my sense is right now, mentally, people are sort of probably to August 1st right now, just mentally, where are we at? And I think universities are really trying to um, in a responsible way to determine how they may be able to bring students back to campus and athletics will, won't will lead that. You know, athletics will be a part of that. And I think that'll be the first trigger, Chris. Do you think we'll have a football season in college? What's the worst case scenario? I think we will. I think we will. I'm a, I want to be a half full guy. <laughs> so do <laughs> and, I. <laughs> and I certainly think we'll have a national championship in college football this year. So, um, but uh, the regular season, baseball is talking about 82 game season. We may not be looking at a 12 game regular season, and it may not be in the traditional fall calendar. I think we just don't know enough yet. So, everything, I guess is in play, Eric. Uh, fortunately, you've got the benefit of time, but mm -hmm. I, I imagine these meetings are pretty tense down there. And, and as you said, you know, a lot of this is getting the sponsors to help out and volunteer and donate and all the things that come together for a major bowl game. 
Yeah, I'm optimistic. Uh, you know, I know this is, you know, obviously a global health crisis and it's here in our country. And uh, there's a lot of major issues that, that are going on. And yeah, I mean, our focus is obviously as the, you know, the, the producer and the and the catalyst behind the Capital and Orange Bowl in the case of the national championship game. We're a host committee. Uh, we are the group that supports the college football playoff enterprise and, and making things come together. So we have two buckets of, of conversation, two different boards that work on this. And yeah, I think everybody's coming in with a very healthy, open-minded approach. They recognize the challenges that are happening across the country. And, you know, we, we, we want to make sure that when those decisions are made, that we're ready to go. Um, there is some really challenging elements to this, you know, from a business standpoint, but we also do it with eyes wide open, understanding that every business, every industry across the country is enduring this right now. We're trying to be, you know, as prepared as we can be. Can be. So when that day comes, when we know de definitively where the direction is, we're able to perform at an optimal level and to make the best of a, a very challenging situation. And I would say this, you know, we're in a community that's built off tourism. And, uh, you know, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Palm Beach are just known for, you know, being that destination of choice across the country. And, you know, it's been hit head on by the COVID-19 crisis. And we look at that window in January and saying, if things come together and there is an opportunity, you know, to stage the 87th Capital One Orange Bowl and to play that national championship game, which we expect to do, we can just imagine how much it will mean that much more to our community to celebrate a tradition that's been here so long, but to bring tourism back in a dramatic way. What's at stake here, Eric, financially? Well, you mentioned it earlier. I mean, the economic impact that's associated with, you know, a traditional Orange Bowl festival uh, that's culminated with the, the, the bowl game, the Capital and Orange Bowl. You know, we've done studies and, you know, we're, we're, we're in the range of $150, $200 million a year. And that spans all the events that we do from our tennis tournament to our swimming classic to ultimately the bowl week and the, and the bowl game itself. Uh, with the national championship game, I mean, it is grown dramatically with the college football playoff. Uh, you mentioned the Super Bowl was here. Incredible success in our marketplace. And uh, this is right there. I mean, this is college football where the passion is second to none. And with that comes, you know, scores and scores of, of, of tourists that come down to follow their respective teams. And uh, it means a lot. I mean, our our community was awarded this national championship game in November of 2017. We're very excited about it. It's uh, now three years uh, into it, and we've been building towards this moment. And, uh, you know, so there's, there's a lot connected to it. There are business models that you have as a bowl organization, as a host committee that uh, you've invested in. So, you know, there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle. But as I mentioned earlier, we're very cognizant and we have a lot of corporate partners and we know that the whole country is going through this. The whole world's going through this. And so uh, we're going to make the best of it. Uh, we're going to make sure that when that business opportunity opens its door, that we'll go through it and we'll make sure that we try to maximize and optimize what the economic impact is. There's always there's always a lot of excitement for you know sports in this country college pro football basketball and just across the state from you in tampa obviously we've got the tom brady story playing out rob Gronkowski is going to be with the tampa bay buccaneers the super bowl this year is in tampa a fellow i know down in tampa who's affiliated with the bucks told me that in the first week of tom brady jersey sales alone they raked in 46 million dollars paying for his you know whole salary almost that whole year. There's so much going on, so much positivity. What would be your greatest disappointment, Eric, first? And then I want to get to Rick too, but what would be your greatest disappointment with this pandemic? Well, we all have the, in, the in, uh, you know, 
in us to lean towards, you know, things that you don't expect to happen, happen. And uh, I'm just built off, you know, optimistic mind frame and knowing what this whole country, this whole world is going through, you know, you, you, you just accept the reality of it and you, you spin to the, the positives. And um, there's so much going on, you know, in the, in the sports landscape. And I think people are eager to come back, you know, in our marketplace, lifelong Miami Dolphins fan. And we just drafted, you know, the, the, the next great quarterback, we hope, in Tua, which I'm very optimistic will be the case. And uh, so I look at the light. I really do. I, I look at the country going through a very difficult window, the prospect of coming back to Hard Rock Stadium and playing Miami Dolphins football, playing the University of Miami, and ultimately getting to these bowl games and to celebrate one of the great traditions in the Orange Bowl. And then to have the opportunity and the privilege to have the national championship game down here, what we can do to, you know, energize our community, energize uh, those fans and tourists that will come down here in January is an immeasurable opportunity. So that's what I rest my hat on. Do you think uh, Tua is tough enough for the NFL? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we had him here for the national semifinal a couple of years ago and uh, incredible athlete, incredible uh, t uh, career at, at the University of Alabama, and um, we're very, very excited. Rick Christ, are there going to be some college sports that don't make it? Are there going to be some pro franchises that don't get through this or get so damaged? It's going to you're going to see a shift in anything dramatic, or do you think we all just buckle down, pray for the proper insurance, and be <laughs> supportive fans, and 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 tough it through? You know, my, my sense, I'm not as close on the pro side, but my sense there is that, um, you know, the major professional leagues uh, um, are built in a way uh, that, that, that their businesses will sustain. I don't know that uh, any franchises would be in jeopardy immediately because of this. I do think on the college side, it's a much uh, more disparate group and um uh you know there's 350 plus division one institutions 130 major college football playing institutions 65 of whom um uh, compete in you know the top conferences with the biggest economic scale and um and and uh there could be Sports that um, uh, get uh, get cut. Uh, you could look at sort of a retrenchment in certain areas. I hope that's not the case. I hope there's other areas that um, uh, that uh, sort of get reset before we start cutting opportunities. But those are uh, those are institutional decisions, Chris. And I do think you're not going to be able to divorce that from the health of the university in toto. And I do think higher ed is going to be faced with some real challenges here. And, um, and so it's, uh, it's an inflection point, I think, in terms of higher education and by virtue of that for, for college sports. And uh, again, that's where I think these leadership moments come in and present themselves and uh uh and and we'll see i don't think we know enough yet what do you think is the most impressive thing you've seen rick when it comes to college sports in terms of dealing with this pandemic <clears throat> what makes you optimistic tonight that we'll get through it um i i've liked the the reports i get from the conference commissioners I like uh, uh, the affirmative statements from university presidents about their belief in, in what they represent and what they offer. Um, I, candidly, it hasn't been 100% that way, but that gives me optimism. Uh, uh, what I've also, and you know, uh, uh, it triggered a little bit earlier in our conversation tonight. I even think about 
you know, what's lost, you know, for a lot of the pro franchises, that, that career arc, even though it's defined, it, it's, um, the, it's not chronological. For a college athlete, that clock stops, starts and stops. And you've got a whole class of teams and a certain class of individuals that didn't get to experience March Madness this year. And they're, they're not going to be able to get that back. And so to see a guy like Scott Van Pelt on ESPN recognize senior night and to try to give those folks their due. So I've loved seeing the stories of student athletes who are, who are staying optimistic and positive and all about being in the moment, uh, resilient as they can be. I do think we're resilient. Uh, Tracy can speak to it more, but we're going to get through this. We're going to get a vaccine. We're going to, um, uh, we're going to be less distant than we are now. And, uh, so I think that, uh, power of informed optimistic belief is what is encouraging to me. Doesn't it seem like it was a year ago when we found out there was not going to be a March? Huh. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's stunning to me. I mean, just absolutely, you know, you talk about, you know, my guys on the Spartans, you know, these, these talk about, you know, they were peaking so late in the season, they had a shot and, uh, you know, Izzo and it, it just, I know it's like the least important thing out of everybody here, you know, Tracy clearly has the most significant <laughs> job saving lives every day. And we're talking about sports, uh, but it, 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 your heart breaks for these kids. Mm -hmm. All right, let's wrap up a little bit here. Tracy, what would it take for you to feel personally comfortable going into a stadium for a sporting event in the fall? A vaccine, for sure, a vaccine. Vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we know that that's probably, what, six months off the very best, most optimistic scenario? I don't know, because the way that this has rolled through the different countries and everything, I mean, there might be a country somewhere that has already, you know, been more advanced than what we are in the states i don't know it's hard to say it's who knows would they can make an announcement in a month and say you know we have a vaccine that's ready to go and we want to use it you just never know and i feel like for everybody people should be prepared to restart their lives when it's possible um i certainly you know want everybody to be able to go out and do things and the, all the college students and all the high schoolers that missed out on their senior year you know they need they do need to start living again. Um, and I certainly hope that they're ready for that when it's time. And hopefully we get that vaccine sooner rather than later. And what about remdesivir? Is that uh, making a difference for, at your medical center? We are using it. Um, as far as how much of a difference it's making, we're using it on the sick patient. So I've used it once um, on my patient. I did not notice a change, but I used it one day and then I didn't have that patient again. So it's hard for me to say. I know that they are still using it. When last we spoke, Tracy, you were actually living in a hotel because your daughter, adult daughter, had come back to Michigan from um, her job in New York City. And you didn't want to infect her potentially being positive in your line of work. You're back home now. Do you feel better about our near-term future tonight as we speak than you did three weeks ago? Uh, for sure. A hundred percent. Yes. I'm still scared that, you know, we're going to have that flare up that I've mentioned. Um, but I do feel better. I feel like now we know what we can do. We know how people are going to respond as far as, you know, sticking together. It's all about being a team, right? You know, everybody working together, trying to get a handle on things. So I do feel better for sure. All right, Rick. Chris, final thoughts tonight. What should people know about the future of college and professional sports? I would say um, uh, that uh, both college and pro sports are no different than our other industries in terms of uh, being able to get out ahead of this. Uh, and I think, um, I think at both levels, uh, those in leadership, and I count the fans as part of this as well, uh, when when there's the opportunity to come back in a safe and uh, smart way, uh, that we'll all be ready for it and excited about it. 
Absolutely. Eric, do you think we're going to be okay for the Orange, Orange Bowl and the uh, National College Football Championships? I do. I really do. I think, as Tracy mentioned, you know, there's a lot of great minds across the world and, and of course, here in the United States that are working on this. And, uh, you know, every week it seems like there's progress making uh, being made towards ultimately a more comfortable environment for people to come and enjoy uh, sporting events, concerts, those sorts of things with an element of realistic uh you know, outlook. We know that it, it, there's still some headwinds to prevail through, but uh, we're excited. We've been through a lot through 87 years and, and we're still standing. And uh, we look at this as an opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, that it'll be a great celebration for not just the Orange Bowl, but for all the bowls across the country, culminating with the college football playoff. i tell you what, uh, with the announcement of this charity golf uh, match that's being televised, what is it? Uh, Peyton Manning and yeah. Phil Mickelson against Tiger and Brady. Is that, yeah. is that right? That's I've never it. been so excited about a televised sport. Event. I like check the I check the listings every day. And then there's, there's a tennis thing, I guess, someplace that might be in Miami or I don't know, but there's there's some pro tennis players who get together. It's it's like we're starved. Yeah, you actually don't know how it ends either. Yeah, right? I, I, exactly. I can't and I can't, I just can't watch old sporting events. I mean, the only one I can watch is when Michigan State beat Michigan in the football game in the final seconds, you know, and that, that that's about it because I, I'd like to torture my my friends with Michigan, but that's about it. Well, listen, you've all been great sports. I appreciate it. Tracy, as always, please stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you for being a dedicated hero on our front lines. Eric and Rick, you're good sports for being here tonight. Thank you for your insights. We will stay in touch as we move through this very uncharted period of our country and our world's history. Thanks and stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you soon. Thanks for pulling us together. Thank you very much. My pleasure. My pleasure. It's a great evening. Thank you all for joining tonight on Have a Seat with Chris Hansen. Tomorrow night, we'll be back in our continuing investigation of Davi Vanity of Blood on the Dance Floor. We will have Ash Costello and Nikki Misery. It's going to be a big deal. They have a lot to say, a lot of things they've never said before. We'll also have Mal Levy with us as well, who's a survivor and uh, an activist now in this investigation. Uh, a lot is happening there, and a lot is happening in the Onision case, our uh, YouTube psycho Brad from Washington State, and we'll have more on that this week as well. In the meantime, I hope everybody is doing well and doing the best they can in this pandemic. I hope everybody stays safe and healthy and at home if possible. Have a great evening and I'll see you tomorrow night.